Hello, let me introduce myself. My name is Janet Todd, and I am a physical therapist with a specialization in treatment of swelling disorders and lymphedema. I have been working with patients with swelling disorders for over 20 years now. I am pleased to be able to share my experience and expertise with you. I will be discussing lymphedema, its causes, and its management with you. I look forward to meeting each of you at our upcoming lab time. Following completion of this lecture, students will be able to define lymphedema, describe what normal lymphatic circulation is, differentiate factors that place a limb or body part at risk for developing lymphedema, and be able to recognize a patient who is at risk for lymphedema and communicate to their physical therapist in charge. Fluid homeostasis in the body is dependent on many factors, which we will go over in this lecture. Imbalances in fluid homeostasis can lead to clinical symptoms of swelling and edema. Some of the reasons why swelling and edema occur include organ failure, circulation problems, normal inflammation associated with wound healing, and the side effects of the treatment for cancer, which is the most common cause for lymphedema in the US. When swelling and edema are present for an extended time, they contribute to such impairments as poor wound healing, decreased range of motion, weakness, and pain. As we know, these impairments can lead to significant functional limitations and disability if not well managed. Lymphedema is defined as the accumulation of protein-rich fluid in the interstitial spaces due to disruption of normal lymphatic drainage either by primary or secondary dysfunction. Chronic edema is defined as any edema present for more than three months, affecting any part of the body, irrespective of the underlying cause. It is considered to be lymphatic swelling in nature. Lymphedema results from the accumulation of protein-enriched fluid in the interstitial spaces due to an imbalance between capillary filtration, capillary resorption, and lymphatic drainage. Lymphedema specifically results from the failure of the lymphatic system. This occurs when the lymphatic load, which is the amount of fluid that needs to be moved per unit time, is greater than the lymphatic transport capacity, which is the amount of fluid that can be moved per unit time. Lymphedema is marked by an abnormal collection of excess tissue proteins, swelling, chronic inflammation, and fibrosis. Lymphedema is a frequent complication of cancer and its treatment. However, it can also occur due to other health problems, injury processes, and surgeries. Lymphedema can occur anywhere in the body that has dysfunctional lymphatic drainage. Updated statistics for lymphedema include a worldwide incidence of 250 million cases, a United States estimated incidence of three to five million cases, all causes. In primary lymphedema, it is estimated to occur in one out of every 100,000 persons. And in secondary lymphedema or chronic edema, which is edema lasting greater than three months, it is estimated to occur in one out of every thousand persons. These pictures are examples of upper extremity lymphedema. One, a male with right upper extremity lymphedema due to breast cancer. Two, a female with bilateral upper extremity and trunk lymphedema due to breast cancer. And three, a female with right upper extremity lymphedema, bilateral breast lymphedema, and right upper extremity brachial plexopathy. All of these patients underwent surgery and radiation therapy as a part of their cancer treatment. Cancer and its treatment is the most frequent cause of upper extremity lymphedema. Here are examples of lower extremity lymphedema. A male whose saphenous vein was stripped for heart surgery, a female with lipedema, a male with cancer in his left groin area, and a male with a deep tissue trauma from a motor vehicle accident. As you can see in these pictures, it is quite common to see lower extremity lymphedema 
for non-cancer related reasons. These pictures are examples of lymphedema due to head and neck cancers. Most head and neck cancer patients will be treated with surgery and or radiation, which will cause internal and or external edema. Management of the swelling is very important as progression of lymphedema in the head and neck patients will lead to impairments in swallowing, speech, and mobility. There are three main categories of swelling disorders. Primary lymphedema, which is associated with dysplasia of the lymphatic system or with other vascular abnormalities, most often due to genetic mutations. The genetic mutation results in aplasia or no development, hypoplasia or underdevelopment, or hyperplasia or overdevelopment of the lymphatic vessels or lymph nodes. Secondary lymphedema results from insult, injury, or obstruction of the lymphatic system. Patients with secondary lymphedema have approximately 70 times greater risk of developing infection in the affected limb or body part than in the unaffected areas due to impairment of the lymphatic system. Chronic edema is any edema lasting greater than three months in which normal lymphatics have failed to remove overload. This type of edema is usually caused by other pathologies or comorbidities. The lymphedema framework provides a classification of causes of secondary lymphedema. The categories are trauma, tissue damage, due to lymph node dissection, radiation therapy, burns, varicose vein surgery or vein harvesting, large or circumferential wounds or scarring. Malignant disease, due to lymph node metastases, infiltrative carcinoma, lymphoma, or pressure from large tumors. Venous disease, due to chronic venous insufficiency resulting in leakage from blood vessels, venous ulceration, post-thrombotic syndrome, or injury to vessels from intravenous drug usage. Infection, due to cellulitis, erysipelas, lymphadenitis, tuberculosis, or filariasis. Inflammation, due to chronic autoimmune disorders, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, dermatitis, psoriasis, sarcoidosis, or dermatotosis. Endocrine disease, such as pretibial myxedema. Immobility dependency, due to dependency or paralysis. This is the swelling that occurs due to failure of the muscle pump in the legs. And finally, factitious or self-harm. This is a less frequent cause in the United States than in other countries with more extensive health insurance and safety net coverage. Factors that can reduce the risk for developing lymphedema. Sentinel node biopsy, or the mapping of the first lymph nodes to which the tumor area drains by means of a radiomark dye, can reduce the risk of developing lymphedema by ensuring that no other nodes need to be taken if the first nodes are negative. Maintaining ideal body weight, i.e. reducing the weight means reducing the lymphatic load. Remaining physically active. Keeping active helps with all aspects of our health, including improving our lymphatic function. Avoiding injury to the at-risk limb. Injury causes inflammation, which results in increased swelling and edema. Maintaining normal range of motion. Normal range of motion allows for the ability to, to move normally which promotes good fluid return and decreases risk of lymphatic stasis. And finally, avoid constriction of or excess pressure on the at-risk limb as this may slow the return of fluid from the limb. Signs and symptoms of lymphedema include complaints of tightness, swelling, or thickening anywhere in the extremity, complaints of burning or tingling sensations in the same extremity, Complaints of heaviness or achiness, inability to wear normal jewelry or clothing, decreased flexibility in the extremity, 
And finally, skin changes in the extremity also are signs and symptoms of lymphedema. Skin changes typically do not appear until the lymphedema has been present for quite some time. It is important to understand normal fluid exchange to be able to better understand lymphedema. Normal fluid exchange occurs at the microvascular level. The components of the microcirculation include capillaries, lymphatic vessels, and protolytic cells or macrophages. Capillaries allow fluid, nutrients, and cellular debris to exit the bloodstream by a process called filtration. Lymphatic channels allow for the return of fluid and cellular debris to the central circulation through a process called resorption. Macrophages in the channels work to break down large particles so they are small enough to enter the lymphatic vessels. A pressure differential between the capillaries, interstitial spaces, and lymphatics drives the process of filtration and resorption. The lining of the capillaries, called the endothelial glycocalyx complex, helps to control fluid exchange as it is hydrophobic and resists fluid resorption into the capillaries. Therefore, 100% of the tissue fluids, cellular debris, and waste products must be picked up by the lymphatics. Our lymphatic system has three main functions. To preserve the fluid balance, enhance and facilitate the immune system through the removal of waste products, cancer cells, bacteria, proteins, fat cells, and organic and inorganic products from the interstitial spaces, and absorption and transport of dietary fats from the gastrointestinal tract. These illustrations provide a look at the extent of our lymphatic system. Without a functioning lymphatic system, it is not possible to live. Our lymphatic system affects all parts of our bodies. This next series of slides will be used to look at the lymphatic circulation in detail. Our lymphatic circulation is a one-way path from our tissue spaces back to the central circulation. Of the approximately eight liters of fluid that exit the bloodstream every day, four liters are returned to the central circulation at the level of the lymph nodes, as the venous capillaries within the lymph nodes do not contain the endothelial glycocalyx complex and can therefore absorb water. The remaining four liters of fluid enters the central circulation at the outlet of the large lymphatic ducts at their junction with the left and right subclavian veins. The initial lymphatics include our prelymphatic channels, which are gutter-like structures that direct tissue fluids into the lymphatic capillaries. Once the tissue fluid enters the lymphatic system, it is referred to as lymph. Our initial lymphatics or lymphatic capillaries are finger-like projections into the tissue spaces and are intimately surrounded by the blood capillary bed, which allows for greater uptake of tissue fluid into the lymphatics. Prelymphatic collectors are the next size up in vessels and help to transport lymph toward the central circulation. The structure of the larger lymphatic vessels include the presence of valves and smooth muscle. The smooth muscle contracts peristaltically to move fluid toward the heart. Each segment between the valves is called a lymph angion, which is the functional unit of the lymphatic circulation. The structure of the lymphatic vessels from the lymphatic collecting vessels to the lymphatic ducts are all the same. Lymph nodes are the biologic filter of our lymphatic system. They work to clean the lymph and play a significant role in our immune responses as a result. Many people describe our lymphatic system as the body's sewer system, and the lymph nodes are therefore the treatment plants. After leaving the lymph nodes, the lymph travels through the larger vessels to enter the circulation at the junction with the right and left subclavian veins. The right lymphatic duct, which drains the right upper quadrant of the body, and the long thoracic duct, which drains the remainder of the body, are the last lymphatic vessels before the central circulation. 
As you must now realize, a disruption in lymph return from the tissue spaces to the central circulation can have a deleterious effect on our bodies. We will now examine the physiology of the lymphatic system. Filtration is the process of fluid movement out of the arterial capillary bed and into the interstitial spaces. Resorption is the process of fluid movement out of the interstitial spaces and into the initial lymphatics. The fluid is composed of plasma, proteins, cell debris, microorganisms, and immune cells. Once it enters the lymphatic vessel, it is called lymph. Edema is a buildup of the fluid in the interstitial or extracellular spaces due to an imbalance between capillary filtration and lymphatic resorption. Fluid buildup in the tissue spaces can result from an increase in the rate of capillary filtration or a decrease in the rate of lymphatic resorption. Increased filtration results from increased hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries, decreased pressure in the tissue, and increased permeability in the capillaries. Increased hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries can happen as a result of such disease processes as congestive heart failure, which is the heart being unable to manage the current blood volume so water is shed from the system into the tissue. Increased membrane permeability can happen with application of heat to the body. Decreased resorption results from decreased plasma protein pressure, increased tissue protein pressure, or lymphatic obstruction. The most common cause of lymphatic obstruction is direct damage to lymphatic vessels or lymph nodes as a result of severe injury or the growth of a tumor. In physical therapy, we are able to affect lymphatic return through many of our normal clinical activities. Such activities include respiratory movement, muscle contraction, pulsation of the arteries, and contraction of the lymph angion, all of which are stimulated through exercise. Changes in tissue pressure can happen with application of compression bandaging. Also, contraction of the lymph angions can be stimulated through manual lymphatic drainage, which is a specialized type of massage designed to affect the contractile weight of the lymph angions. Normal lymphatic drainage is divided into regional areas by watersheds. A watershed is an area away from which lymph fluid normally flows. However, the watersheds contain small regions in line with the regional lymph node beds, across which lymph fluid is carried from one body region to another. We can make use of this to reduce swelling in an affected body part by helping it to cross the watershed to an unaffected area. For example, fluid can be carried across the waist from the upper trunk to the lower trunk to help decrease lymph fluid buildup in an arm following the treatment for breast cancer. Watersheds follow the frontal, sagittal, and transverse planes of the body. In addition, we have watersheds at the saddle and shoulder girdle area. The regional drainage areas of the body drain toward the regional lymph nodes located in each axilla, supraclavicular fossa, along the sternocleidomastoid muscle, in the iguanal region, in the abdominal wall, pelvic region, mesenteric region, popliteal fossa, and cubital fossas. There are four stages of lymphedema. Stage zero, or the latency stage, presents as subclinical edema. No swelling is observable, but histological exam shows identical findings as with other stages of lymphedema, including presence of edema in the tissue, fibrosis, dilated lymphatic vessels, and fluid stagnation. Stage one, or spontaneous reversible lymphedema, presents with a 
edema that disappears with bed rest or elevation, edema that is soft or pitting, which sometimes makes it hard to differentiate from venous edema, and a stem or sign, which is usually negative. Stage two, or spontaneously irreversible lymphedema, is edema that does not decrease with bed rest or elevation, edema that is non-pitting, however, a strong pressure may be able to produce some pitting. Tissue fibrosis in induration begins to be present and feels thick and firm when compared to a normal tissue. The skin starts to thicken and tissue thickening due to the presence of fibrosis begin to occur. Stage three, lymphostatic elephantiasis, which presents with extensive fibrosis within the limb, hardening and thickening of the skin, papillomas of the skin, fatty deposits and hypertrophic muscle tissue develop, and deep creases at the joints occur. Lymphatic failure occurs as a result of two processes or a combination of the two processes. High output failure of a lymphatic system or dynamic insufficiency is due to lymphatic load exceeding a normal transport capacity in an otherwise intact lymphatic system. Low output failure or mechanical insufficiency of the lymphatic system is due to impaired transport capacity, which is less than the physiologic or normal lymphatic load. And combined failure is a combination of both dynamic and mechanical insufficiency resulting in increased lymphatic load and impaired lymphatic return. Lymphedema occurs when the lymphatic system is no longer able to remove the normal lymphatic load, either due to developmental abnormalities, as in primary lymphedema, or damage to the lymphatic system, as in secondary lymphedema. Valvular failure results when the valve flaps no longer meet and the lymph refluxes or flows backwards into distal regions of the body. Disordered contractility of the lymph angion occurs in chronic lymphedema, which reduces the effective pumping power of these vessels and therefore results in less fluid movement per unit time. Structural failure of lymphatic vessels can be caused by trauma, inflammation, or physical obstruction. This happens as a result of injury, surgery, radiation, tumor growth, or the development of fibrosis from long-standing lymphatic congestion. Lack of normal mobility, both range of motion and functional mobility can severely limit normal lymphatic return and contribute to the development of worsening lymphedema. Medical management of lymphedema may include both conservative treatments and surgical treatment. Conservative treatment includes complete decongestive therapy, which is what we do in physical therapy, the use of intermittent programmable pneumatic pumps, such as the FlexiTouch pump, which help with ongoing self-management, weight loss education and weight loss to help decrease the lymphatic load, low level laser therapy to promote improved lymphatic circulation, and pharmacologic therapies. Pharmacologic therapies are currently being researched and they include lymph angiogenic therapies, which are medications to promote increased lymph vessel growth for improved lymphatic function, anti-inflammatory therapies, which are medications to reduce the negative impacts of inflammation on the lymphatic structures, and anti-fibrotic therapies, which are medications to reduce the development of tissue fibrosis, which makes it more difficult to manage lymphedema. Surgical treatment is generally considered palliative and not curative. Most surgical techniques will require ongoing use of compression garments. However, they also result in decreased limb size, which improves function and mobility. 
Current techniques most used include lethal venous bypass or anastomosis, which is the process of grafting a lymphatic vessel into a blood vessel to promote improved lymphatic return. This is best for early lymphedema intervention. Vascularized lymph node transplantation, which is the process of removing a lymph node with its attached blood vessel and lymphatic vessels and transplantation into the area where lymph nodes were removed. This is also best for early edema, early lymphedema intervention. And finally, suction-assisted protein lipectomy. This is best for advanced lymphedema, and this is a process by which liposuction is used to remove the hypertrophic fat and fibrotic tissues from the subdermal layer in order to reduce limb volume. Complete decongestive therapy continues to be the gold standard for the treatment of lymphedema. Complete decongestive therapy is usually provided by physical therapist or occupational therapist. The components of CDT include manual lymphatic drainage, compression of the involved body part, patient education, exercise instruction, skin care, and home management training. In the next series of slides, we will look in more detail at each of the components. Manual lymphatic drainage is a specialized massage technique to stimulate improved lymphatic drainage. The purpose of manual lymphatic drainage is to stimulate the superficial and deep lymphatic vessels through specialized massage strokes to increase lymph angion contraction rate. To promote improved resorption of protein molecules from the tissue spaces, to promote fluid movement from areas with lymphatic congestion to areas without lymphatic congestion. This is either in the same drainage region or across the watershed to adjacent drainage regions of the body. And finally, to increase transport capacity of the available lymphatics. Principles to keep in mind when performing manual lymphatic drainage massage. First, treat the trunk and po proximal areas prior to treating the distal areas. Stretch the skin, not muscle, so as to get the greatest impact on the lymph angions. This requires a light touch. The pressure must change smoothly to promote a pumping action in the tissue. The direction of the pressure during the massage is always in the direction of desired fluid flow. You perform five to 10 strokes in each body area or location to increase the lymph angion activity. There is a pressure phase on in the direction of fluid flow and a pressure phase off, which lets the skin spring back to neutral for each stroke. Also, avoid redness, pain, or soreness during the massage, as this can promote increased inflammation and therefore reduce the effectiveness of the manual lymphatic drainage. Compression for management of lymphedema is used for reduction of limb volume or for maintenance of limb volume. Reduction is achieved by specialized technique using a multi-layer compression bandage with short stretch elastic bandages to achieve a pressure gradient with higher pressure distally and lower proximally to promote fluid movement from the limb back into the central circulation. The purpose of compression is to help decrease fibrosis, maintain the effects of the manual lymphatic drainage massage, increase the tissue pressure, increase the mechanical efficiency of the muscle pump, decrease tissue filtration, and increase tissue resorption. Principles of multi-layer compression bandaging application for limb reduction include creating a soft cast to make a cone shape, which makes the compression gradient and increases the effectiveness of the muscle pump 
to help drain the affected limb. The use of foam padding to shape the limb and protect the bony prominences. The application of short stretch bandages from distal to proximal with minimal stretch to provide for the pressure gradient and to form the, shock, the soft cast. Before applying the multilayer compression bandage, you need to consider signs and symptoms of possible infection, wound, or injury, which may require the need for medical management. Patient education occurs throughout the provision of complete decongestive therapy care. It includes educating the patient and or their family members about lymphedema, the disease process and prognosis, the treatment process and expected outcomes, skin care to reduce the risk of infection or injury, exercise for promotion of increased lymphatic return and normalization of mobility and function, self-massage or use of a compression pump for ongoing home management, compression garment usage including selection, donning, and doffing training, and home management training as lymphedema is considered to be a chronic disease which will progress if not managed. Regular exercise is recommended for all patients with lymphedema. It is to help maintain health status and mobility and to stimulate lymphatic flow through muscle contraction, pulsation of arteries, and deep breathing. Research in the breast cancer population has shown that people who regularly participate in light aerobic and light weight training exercises experienced fewer episodes of swelling in their limb than those who did not. Good skin care is vital for all lymphedema patients. Due to the swelling associated with lymphedema, the skin of the involved area is not as healthy as in the uninvolved area. Since your skin is the first barrier to infection, good skin care is needed to reduce the risk of infection and prevent disease progression. Patients are instructed to perform daily skin checks, to maintain cleanliness, avoid injuries through use of protective clothing, sunscreen, or bug spray, and to regularly apply moisturizers to maintain skin health. The goal of complete decongestive therapy is to help each patient progress to a home management program. Home management program includes self-massage or use of a compression pump, self-bandaging as needed, the regular wearing of a compression sleeve or stocking, appropriate skin care, regular exercise, and risk reduction techniques. When providing complete decongestive therapy, it is important to have a good understanding of the precautions and contraindications for care in order to maximize positive outcomes. In the presence of an acute infection, manual lymphatic drainage should not be performed. However, once the patient has been on antibiotics for 72 hours, it is okay to proceed. The reason for this is to allow the lymphatic system to function in its immune capacity during the acute phase of the infection. If a new malignancy is suspected, it is important to have the patient evaluated medically prior to continuation of care. However, there is no restriction to participation in complete decongestive therapy if the patient is under medical management for their cancer. Congestive heart therapy results when the heart is unable to pump the normal blood volume. Since the goal of complete decongestive therapy is to return fluid to the central circulation, which increases the blood volume, it is important to proceed with caution even when the patient is under medical management to control their congestive heart therapy. Organ failure, such as kidney or liver failure, is important to consider as these organs play a role in processing of excess fluid and toxins. Pulmonary edema is likely to worsen with manual lymphatic drainage, causing difficulty with breathing and potential health decline. Active tuberculosis affects the breathing, 
and the symptoms can be exacerbated with performance of manual lymphatic drainage. Venous thrombosis or arterial disease are problems of the blood circulation and can be aggravated by either manual lymphatic drainage as with blood clots or compression as with peripheral arterial, arterial disease. Recent bronchial asthma is again a problem of the breathing and symptoms can be aggravated with performance of manual lymphatic drainage. It is recommended to avoid mobilization to the neck of people over the age of 60 due to possible carotid artery changes, hyperthyroidism, or carotid sinus hypersensitivity, as aggravation of any of these problems could cause a decline in health. It is recommended to avoid deep abdominal techniques with patients with a history of irritable bowel, Crohn's disease, colitis, chronic diarrhea, or if the patient has had a history of recent abdominal radiation. It is recommended to avoid performance of manual techniques over radiated tissue for up to two months following treatment. However, the surrounding tissue can be treated. Here is a list of the current cancer statistics in the United States. Of note, the risk of developing cancer over the course of a lifetime is one in two for males and one in three for females. The total number of new cases in the US is nearly two million in the last year. I have included on the list those cancer types with over 80,000 new cases in the last year. The current trends in cancer treatment outcomes are toward increased five-year relative survival rates. Therefore, there are more people surviving with the side effects of cancer and its treatment than ever. This is an area in which we in the physical therapy field can have an impact. Through the rehab services we offer, we can help improve quality of life for the cancer survivor. The most current statistics based on data through 2018 indicate that there are an estimated 18 million children and adults living after cancer in the United States as of January 1, 2022. Cancer survival is influenced by cancer type, patient age and stage at cancer diagnosis, patient socioeconomic status, treatment, health insurance coverage, competing health conditions, access to treatments, the financial resources of the patient and their family, racial inequities related to implicit and explicit biases, and physician and patient attitudes, beliefs, and preferences regarding cancer treatment. Cancer treatment techniques frequently contribute to the development of lymphedema. These treatment techniques include lymph node dissection and radiation. Upper extremity lymphedema is most frequently due to the treatment for breast cancer. Treatment for other cancers of the head, neck, and upper body can also result in lymphedema of the upper quadrants. Lower extremity lymphedema can be related to cancers of the lower extremity, pelvic area, genitals, and inguinal regions. Swelling disorders can contribute to the development of lymphedema. Venous edema consists of low viscosity, protein-poor interstitial fluid due to the increase in capillary filtration. In the presence of long-standing venous edema, lymphedema can develop due to impairments within the lymphatic system developing as a result of excess fluid in the tissue over an extended period of time. Lymphedema consists of a protein-rich interstitial fluid within the skin and subcutaneous tissues due to lymphatic dysfunction. When considering a diagnosis of lymphedema, it is important to rule in or out other contributing factors to swelling disorders. 
Differential diagnosis needs to consider the presence of other disease processes which may contribute to the development of swelling. Such processes include the presence of cancer, congestive heart failure, which is characterized by dependent edema with shortness of breath and fatigue, kidney failure, liver failure, pulmonary hypertension, which is commonly caused by sleep apnea, but can also be caused by left heart failure or chronic lung disease. Certain medications can contribute to lower extremity swelling, including calcium channel blockers and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Idiopathic edema occurs only in menstruating women in their 20s and 30s. These patients will often complain of face and hand swelling as well. Deep vein thrombosis presents most commonly in an acutely swollen, painful leg. It may also be discolored. It can occasionally present as mild, painless, asymmetric edema. Lipedema is a medical condition resulting in the abnormal deposition of body fat in specific areas of the body, causing undue burden on the local circulation, which can progress to lymphedema if left unmanaged. Premenstrual edema, pregnancy can sometimes result in lower extremity swelling due to venous pressure from the enlarging uterus. Recurrent tissue trauma from injuries or surgeries to a specific area can damage the lymphatic system and contribute to the development of lymphedema. Infections such as cellulitis put undue stress on the lymphatic system and if recurrent can also contribute to the development of lymphedema. Why is it important to treat lymphedema? Edema contributes to poor wound healing. For every one centimeter of increased limb girth, there is 10 times the distance for tissue nutrients to move to provide nutrition for gas exchange and metabolism of waste products needed in wound healing. Poor wound healing and chronic inflammation decrease overall health of the individual, which puts them at risk for medical and functional complications through the re throughout the remainder of their lives. With good treatment, including a comprehensive self-management program, people with lymphedema or chronic edema do not have to live restricted lives due to their condition. In summary, lymphedema and chronic edema can be an easily overlooked complication for many of our patients. Its impact on wound healing, mobility, and pain can lead to poor prog progress and or poor outcomes with rehabilitation and physical therapy treatment. An awareness of the issues and how they may be addressed can help improve the quality of patient care, including potentially decreasing complications as well as the patient's time in rehab. Thank you for your time with this presentation. I look forward to seeing you during our lab time in the near future. I am happy to take the opportunity to answer your questions and demonstrate as well as practice some of the treatment techniques I have described in this lecture.